Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come and uh, participate in this panel. And, and Dr. Tonklin um, is one that uh, I invited to be on the, the uh, uh, rewrite of this last uh, our article, specifically because she was from uh, radiology. And she's at Intermountain Medical Center at uh, Intermountain Healthcare in Utah. And uh, she, she's a very good MRI radiologist. And we had a lot of debates as to what is uh, appropriate for workup of uh, uh, the, the, the pregnant patient. Was it ultrasound? Uh, was it uh, a CT scan? Was it MRI? How much uh, radiation exposure would the fetus and the mother have if we did CT scan? And we have some very uh, good uh, updated information in the current guideline uh, about all those issues. So I would encourage you to take a look at that because there, there are some phenomenal uh, things that can be used. A lot of places don't have MRI. Some places have a, just a CT scan. There has been information about just doing exploratory laparoscopy could lead to increased uh, preterm delivery. So some sort of uh, diagnosis preoperatively seems to be very helpful. But I refer you to that for, uh, for her uh, information that she's helped us with. So I was asked to specifically talk about uh, you know, the, the trimester and the choice of surgery, the role of MIS and fetal monitoring. And some of this uh, Dr. Pearl spoke a little bit about, but I'm going to go a little bit more in detail. First off, real quickly, how many of you have operated on a pregnant patient laparoscopically? Can I just see by show of hands? Isn't that wonderful? Because in the early 90s, my first one of the patients sent to me was somebody sent with a big, huge open wound, 28 weeks pregnant, and I said, why didn't they do it laparoscopically? And they said, well, because I was pregnant. They told me I couldn't do it that way. And I still find around the world, as we go around, that there is still some sort of a, a, a little concern about operating on pregnant patients. So the, the question... Does this work? Uh, I don't have any disclosures. So an ER physician calls you, 22-week pregnant patient. Uh, it looks, sounds like they have an acute appendicitis. What would you do if they were 22 weeks? How would you approach them if they were eight weeks? And how would you approach them if they were 34 weeks? Does it make a difference? Uh, what if it was a cholecystitis rather than appendicitis? Would you approach it differently? And I think uh, you heard the, the comment that Truly in the guidelines, we, we have a strong recommendation that laparoscopy can be safely performed in any trimester of pregnancy when uh, the operation is indicated. Now, this was a, a concern early on, and people initially would say, well, you need to wait, especially with the things that aren't acute, like an appendicitis, you, can, you should wait till the second trimester. Because they were worried whether or not there's an abortion rate uh, uh, of about 12% in the open literature. And also, if you're in a third trimester, maybe there's a 40% chance of having a, uh, a preterm delivery. But again, that was in the open literature. And then, then the concerns were, what about long-term effects? This is actually my daughter, with her permission, and my son. Uh, she's a handicap from a different uh, problem. But the concern was, was there going to be some sort of long-term detrimental effect? And it turns out that there's, that information is from open literature, and none of it is true in the laparoscopic literature. So that laparoscopic appendectomy certainly may be performed safely in any patient with acute appendicitis. Now, obviously, it doesn't matter which trimester. Um, so I was asked to look at uh, how do we interoperatively monitor the patient and what is the initial abdominal access that's most appropriate. And as we look at the uh, fetal monitoring, uh, the early S uh, SAGES guidelines was uh, a guideline that had eight guidelines. And those eight guidelines were based on some very minimal uh, research data. Um, and, and so some of those early guidelines were even including some fetal scalp monitoring, very invasive. And that's where we first wrote the first guideline. The one that just came out this last year is the third time that we've updated this now. Guideline 21, fetal heart monitoring should occur pre- and postoperatively in the setting of urgent abdominal surgery during pregnancy. When you have the abdomen markedly distended, monitoring them with some sort of belt around them is not going to work. And it turns out that there are no interoperative fetal heart rate abnormalities reported um, in, in the literature. And so we truly feel like this is a fairly good recommendation, pre- and post-op evaluation. What kind of pressure? Well, uh, Dr. Pearl mentioned maybe 15, maybe 12. Uh, what, what is the right amount? And people are saying, well, you should use less, maybe 12, maybe 10, maybe 8. But as you go further down, then you have less visualization. So then the question of can it be more dangerous to use less pressure became a question. The guideline states CO2 insufflation of 10 to 15 millimeters can be safely used for laparoscopy in the pregnant patient. 
the level of insufflation pressure should be adjusted to the patient's physiology. Now, what are we concerned about? Well, maternal, about pulmonary issues and visualization, and fetal issues, about acidosis in the fetus. So as we look at maternal pulmonary issues, we can look at, well, the growing fetus certainly causes pressure on the diaphragm. This can lead to residual volume and decreased functional residual capacity. This also then leads to de decreased PaO2. However, pressures of 15 millimeters of mercury, there has been no increased adverse outcomes to the patient or fetus. And so visualization actually may become important and would keep that in mind. Now what about the fetus? In those first eight guidelines uh, years ago was based on uh, some animal studies in four ewe, four, four sheep. And, uh, and certainly there is some little changes in acidosis. So we worry, does the CO2 of the pneumoperitoneum cause increased acidosis? Can it lead to tachycardia, hypertension, and hypercapnia? Well, as it turns out, again, there's no evidence to support any long-term detrimental effect effects resulting from CO2 pneumoperitoneum in humans. So in terms of monitoring the patient intraoperatively, um, the intraoperative CO2 monitoring, some people have suggested, well, do we need to do a maternal blood gas and run an A-line? Um, uh, the intraoperative CO2 monitoring actually by capnography should be used during laparoscopy in the pregnant patient. Capnography adequately reflects maternal acid-base status in humans. So we don't need to have invasive monitoring while we go ahead and do our laparoscopic procedures in the pregnant patient. You know, we were shown earlier about the changing fundal height, and this is the picture of a, a pregnant uterus that we've all seen when we do laparoscopy, depending on what stage of the pregnancy. And keeping that in mind is extremely important. By 20 weeks, I usually use the umbilicus. This is where I expect to find the uterus. For initial port placement, this was a constant area of debate and continues to be. I've heard people stand up and say the only way you should enter the abdomen in a pregnant patient is with an Hassan technique. I have other people say, no, it's only with a various needle technique. And I have people say, well, you can do it either way. It turns out that initial access can be safely accomplished with an open or Hassan, the various needle, or an optical trocar if the location is adjusted according to fundal height previous incisions and experience of the surgeons. And it's interesting, in the studies that we had that we did early on, actually the Hassan technique almost reached statistical significance for early preterm delivery. Now, I didn't quite reach the statistical significance for that, so majority of the time I do use a various needle, but again, taking in context the gravid uterus. So in the first trimester, uh, initial entry may be just above the umbilicus, second trimester up in the right upper quadrant, and third trimester even higher. Um, in our studies, uh, we, we looked at laparoscopic cholecystectomy and laparoscopic appendectomy and, and how people actually uh, uh, entered the abdomen. And it's interesting as you look, uh, as, as it goes from first trimester to second trimester to third trimester, there is a, a little bit more of a, a change towards a Hassan technique. But you look at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In the first trimester, is about 67% by a varies needle, and even at the third trimester, over half were being done with a varies needle technique. Laparoscopic appendectomy, about 50%. So I think taking into consideration your skills, your techniques, which you usually use, is probably going to be the safest way to enter the abdomen in the pregnant patient. So these kind of guidelines that we have, we've just talked about specifically a couple specific ones. We have about 22 guidelines in the current uh, guideline that we've just published. Uh, you know, surgical diseases present as new diagnostic and therapeutic dilemmas in the pregnant patient. And when I was faced with uh, a patient with severe uh, ulcerative colitis, uh, one of them at 12 weeks pregnant, one of them at 22 weeks pregnant, that they were bleeding, they were on TPN, they were losing weights, the babies were not doing well, able to find and use the guidelines from SAGES to help us guide our, our treatment, We're able to laparoscopically do total colectomies with endileostomies, and then show that their hematocrits went up, their nutrition went up, the babies did well, and then able to go back after the delivery and do the J-pouch reconstruction. So these evidence-based guidelines should help clinicians to minimize fetal risk while providing the benefits of laparoscopic surgery to the mother, and I would suggest Rather than going to the internet and say, go to surgery.com, scroll down and click on, are you totally lost icon, I would recommend you go to sages.org, 
scroll down and click on guidelines. They can be very helpful. Thank you very much.